$4 billion is a lot of money. It can buy you an archipelago of private islands in the Caribbean, the most expensive penthouses in Manhattan, a fleet of Gulf Streams and Skortskis, 1,000 Bugatti Chirons, and still leave you with enough change to live the rest of your life in the top 0.0001%. The Ford Motor Company burnt through a similar amount in less than two years and had nothing to show for it. Here's the story. You are watching Zeitgeist Media. The 1957 Ford Edsel was supposed to take the automotive industry by storm. Edsel, the car that is already making automotive history for Ford Motor Company. Marketed with dizzying fervor as the premier new car for the American middle class, the Edsel was predicted to break all previous sales records. Ford was so confident in the product that it pumped $2.5 billion into the project. But instead of starting a revolution, the company lost almost double that on this unattractive gas guzzler. When the dust settled, only a $4 billion hole remained. So what went wrong? America in the 1950s was undergoing a great transition. The mist of World War II had lifted and the light at the end of the tunnel seemed within reach. The United States had become the world's strongest military power. Its economy was booming, and the fruits of its prosperity meant a novel and growing middle class with new cars, suburban houses, and an abundance of other consumer goods. The motor car had become the symbol of this growing and affluent middle class. Young company executives and their families placed a lot of importance in the car they drove. For them, cars were more than a means of getting from point A to B, but rather a physical embodiment of their individuality, values, and affluence. Automobile sales had shot through the roof, and more than 58 million cars were sold in the United States through the 50s, making Detroit the beating heart of America. Stock prices of the big three, that is, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, gyrated upwards so frantically that Congress stepped in and began to investigate. The Ford Motor Company had become a behemoth in the industry, accounting for nearly a third of all vehicles sold in the 50s, and they were no strangers to taking big risks. They had been toying with the idea of producing a new car in the medium price range since 1948, a segment wherein cars cost between $2,400 and $4,000, and were meant for the upper middle class. Ford had good reason for wanting to do so. It was common practice in those days for lower income earners to choose brands such as Ford, Plymouth, and Chrysler. But as they worked their way up the corporate ladder and their annual income rose above $5,000, they would quickly trade up their inferior Fords for medium-priced cars, which usually ended up being an Oldsmobile, Buick, or Pontiac, all owned by General Motors. Ford's only offering in this medium price range was the Mercury, and it was not a customer favorite. This was a source of constant annoyance for Ford management, who felt that they had been growing customers for General Motors. Both conventional wisdom and detailed studies pointed to the merit of putting out a new motor car in the medium price range. The Ford bosses were well aware of the enormous risks associated with putting a new car on the market. Nevertheless, the men in Dearborn felt bullish. So bullish, in fact, that they set aside $250 million for the development of this new car. In April 1955, the development was green-lighted, and a special products division was set up to implement it. So began two years of hard work. The vision for the e-car, or experimental car, as the project came to be known, was to build a revolutionary medium price car that would quickly turn the segment on its head and become the premier choice thanks to its new age styling, features, and performance. $250 million later, after multiple iterations and revisions, the e-car, which had been christened the Edsel, was now ready. Ford ran a masterful advertising campaign prior to the launch of the Edsel. The public was constantly teased with silhouettes and shadows of the Edsel in prominent print and digital media in the run-up to its public reveal. The campaign was a fantastic success. By the Edsel's launch date, public anticipation had reached fever pitch. The Edsel was launched over a three-day conclave open only to automotive journalists and reporters. Select reporters were then allowed to drive the Edsel back to dealerships in their hometown, giving the public its first look at the Edsel. The Edsel finally went on sale the following week. The most striking physical characteristic of the Edsel 
was its slender and vertical radiator grille. This was in stark contrast to the wide and horizontal grilles standard at the time. The rear, too, was a marked departure from the conventional design of the day. Gone were the notorious tail fins, replaced with what looked like wings of a gull in flight. In other respects, the exterior styling of the Edsel was not far out of the ordinary. In its interior, the Edsel was the epitome of the push-button era. The dashboard contained a devilish assemblage of push-button gadgets, the likes of which had not been seen previously. Buttons opened the trunk lid, popped the hood, released the parking brake, operated the lights and most other features of the car. At launch, the Edsel came in four major variants, which were then subdivided into a total of 18 variants. These models differed in size, shape, power, trim, and price. When the wraps came off the Edsel, it received mixed reviews. Most newspapers stuck with straight descriptions of the car, while criticism from magazines was more exhaustive and generally more severe. The overarching opinion at the time was that the car was mostly conventional, had no basic advantages over other brands, and was filled with gimmicky gadgets that were being confused for luxuries. Things didn't go badly at first. On launch day, more than 6,500 Edsels were sold, but over the next few days, sales dropped sharply. By the end of the first month, Ford was delivering only about 300 Edsels a day. This was far from the 600 to 700 cars a day it needed for the Edsel program to stay profitable. Ford emptied its playbook trying to ramp up sales. Television specials were held with A-list stars. Live Newspapers were filled with full-page ads. Dealers were made to slash hundreds of dollars off the price tags. Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, Rosemary Clooney, Louis Armstrong, Lindsay Crosby, and the Four Preps. These frantic and expensive measures slightly boosted sales, but could not be sustainable for long periods of time. The men in Dearborn, realizing they had laid an egg with the Edsel, looked for ways to minimize the damage. A merger with Mercury and Lincoln was carried out to no avail. By November 1960, nearly three years after its launch, there were only 110,000 Edsels on the road. A far cry from the 300,000 a year Ford expected to sell, and the 200000 a year needed to keep the program profitable. The company finally pulled the plug and shut down the project. Financial gurus estimate that the net loss to the Ford Motor Company was nearly $350 million in 1960, which in today's money equates to nearly $4 billion. An interesting fact is that the company would have saved itself money had it not produced the Edsel but rather given away 110,000 of its comparably priced car, the Mercury. Various explanations have been offered as to how Ford, with its big brains, deep pockets, and industrial expertise, could have made such a colossal misstep. The most succinct of these is that the Edsel was a classic case of the wrong car for the wrong market at the wrong time. After some careful analysis and research, we arrived at a few key reasons why we think the Edsel failed. Firstly, the lack of focus in its vision. The Edsel designers knew that they were creating a new character or a personality with this car, but instead of refining their vision, they decided to make it everything at once. In a lazy attempt to please everybody, they made the terrible decision to debut 18 variations of the car at launch. Secondly, personal ego trumped research. In the Edsel's case, despite the vast consumer research carried out, most of it was thrown out the window. For example, a market research firm had spent nearly 40,000 hours arriving at a list of five possible names for the new model. At the last minute, however, the board decided to scrap the list and go ahead with the name Edsel, an homage to Henry Ford II's father. On another occasion, the principal designer of the car repeatedly chose to ignore feedback from targeted focus groups with regard to how the car looked and stuck to his initial design. Third, product-centric, versus customer-centric. 
The team behind the Edsel had gotten so lost in the process of making this car revolutionary that they forgot to ask themselves, what is the customer looking for? What does the customer need? And how can we improve the customer's experience? The result was a well-intentioned bag of bolts. Fourth, too many cooks spill the broth. Bad circumstances played a big role in the Edsel's demise, but in hindsight, it seems the car was doomed from the start. Ford had a wealth of smart executives at the time. With too many hands working on the Edsel, the, the project had no direction. It's no coincidence that the world's most successful cars, the Model T, the Beetle, the Mini, and others, were conceived by individuals or small groups. The more people working on a car, the more its intent gets muddied, even if you have the brightest, best intention minds in the business. Fifth and final, expectations had been raised to impossible standards. Ford's launch campaign gave customers the expectation that they were about to get an irresistible car of the future. With expectations set so high, even a mediocrely good car was doomed to disappoint. Ford did a lot of things right, but mistakes were made along the way by both people and committees with the best intentions. But, as they say, hindsight is 2020. What do you think were some of the reasons the Edsel program collapsed? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, subscribe to Zeitgeist Media and give this video a thumbs up. Feel free to check out our channel for any other content that may interest you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.